Hi there folks, glad you could join us. Uh, today's session or sessions are on principles for outdoor or outgoing evangelism, uh, for when we are de deliberately taking the gospel out to where the people are. And I'm going to be sharing with you 20 principles uh, that have to do with doing this in a way that's God honouring, that honours the people that we're seeking to reach and that is successful. I'm um, going to start with the reading from the scriptures. I think uh, we need to recognise that when it comes to evangelism, in a sense the Holy Spirit is the evangelist, Jesus is the model, the God-man who, who demonstrated how to treat people in a way which will bring the greatest fruitfulness in their lives. So we can't do better than to read a few verses from the scriptures in John chapter 4 where Jesus uh, goes out to communicate uh, or on his journey communicates with this lady uh, from Samaria. So we're dealing here with an interpersonal interaction between the Saviour and uh, a person who is very different to him. She is a woman and that in the culture makes a significant difference. Uh, she is a Samaritan and that in that culture makes a big difference. There was a social status issue there, there was a racism issue there from general Jews in regard to Samaritans. So Jesus is going to communicate with a person who is a different gender, a person who is different culturally, different racially, and uh, someone who is used to being considered worthless by your average person in that, in that world. So this is a great demonstration for sharing the gospel in a multi-ethnic society like we live in now in New Zealand. So I'm going to read these words from the scriptures. Now he had to go through Samaria, so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. So I'm in John chapter 4, and I'm now starting verse 6. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour, midday. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who drank? gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his flocks and herds. Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is that you've had five husbands, and the man you, are now, you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is Jerusalem. Jesus declared, Believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshippers must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. The disciples declared, I who speak to you am he. 
Well, that was more than a few verses, but it gives us a good foundation for the how of evangelism with people uh, that you don't know. And uh, the whole point about going out with the gospel is you're likely to be communicating with people that you don't know. So I want to make some uh, I want to make some statements of principle that I believe come to bear on effectively sharing the faith. The principle one is that we are dealing with people, not just souls. The Bible teaches us that we are tripartite beings, that we have body, that we have soul, that we have spirit. And I don't think we should break that up in evangelism. Yeah, certainly those are distinct, but they're also integrated. We're dealing with whole people here. And whole people, um, you know, the spirit and the soul are interconnected. When we are spiritually sick, then our soul, our mind, our emotions, our will are affected. And, and even our bodies are affected because we're, we're, we're interconnected, we're integrated. We're, we're designed to live in harmony, body, soul and, heart, and spirit. And in evangelism, often we try to just hit the spirit. But we need to remember that between the spirit and us, us is the person, the emotions, the will. So we, if we're going to reach the spirit, we need, we need to go through the soul, in a sense. And we, and, and we need to connect with the person in a way where they're going to be open to the communication of the gospel. So the first thing to understand is we're not just after souls, we're, we're after whole people. We want the whole person to come to Christ, body, soul, and spirit. And uh, that might sound strange, but a lot of people, where they say, oh, how many souls did you get this week? As if they're kind of like, just kind of like notches on your belt, or numbers that you can put in your newsletter. To be effective in evangelism, we, rec we need to recognize that these are people. These are body, soul, spirit, and each part of that is important to God. And uh, each part of that is, is what we're relating to. So principle one, we're dealing with people, whole people. People that are unique. People that are not just like sheep where they're all pretty much the same. People that are unique, they have a unique history, they have a new background, unique background, they have a new, unique cultural understanding of life, they have a, new, a unique sin pattern in their life that's theirs and there's alone. So we're dealing with a human being that is not unique. One of the big problems in outdoor evangelism is routines where you railroad people like sheep down the track. You want, you want to get them saved. You want to get them to repent. You want to get them to Christ. And so you send them down the kind of narrow chute that is your idea, our idea of how we need to get saved. But we don't understand that they're actually individuals. And though salvation is the same for all, it requires faith in Christ and repentance. Um, the, the journey to that is for some people different. So we're dealing with unique individuals. That's what I'm trying to get across. I hope you've got that point. We're dealing with people, not just kind of souls, not numbers, not beings that are all the same. The second principle is that in relationship, we need to, in our culture, we need to introduce ourselves appropriately. So if you, um, it doesn't need to be in great depth, it doesn't like need to be an American introduction when you're about to address a big audience and then make you out to be like the Apostle Paul, but it does need to be genuine and sincere. So it's kind of like, hi, I'm Lou. How are you going? It's friendly, it's letting them know who your name is, and it's not intimidating in any way. So introduce yourself to the person. Don't just sit down without them knowing who you are. You don't need to give them your life story. Simply introduce yourself by name. And, uh, and, and the third principle is it's really important to learn the name of the person that you're speaking to. This is critical. When you address me by name, um, it, it, it does something in the communication. It tells me that I'm important enough for you to remember my name. And uh, it's not always easy. A 
you're anything like me, you can ask a person their name, and if you don't focus at that point on the name, it goes in one ear and out the other. And you find yourself 20 seconds later thinking, now what was your name again? And maybe it happens often at church or places like that or a meeting. And you're hoping somebody will come along and call them by name so you don't get caught out that you didn't remember their name. And so it's really important in that introductory stage of speaking to somebody, maybe you've knocked on their door or you've come to sit beside them in the street, to, uh, to remember their name and to use it as much as reasonably possible in the first minute or two. That'll help it to sort of be ingrained and graven on your short-term memory. Uh, so remembering the name, learning the name, remembering the name is important in communication. And then we want to build rapport. We want to develop a relationship with this person. I'm not talking a deep, deep relationship like you have with a friend. But we're actually going to relate here person to person. So we want to develop a kind of trust that you're not going to push them beyond where they want to go. Nobody likes a hard sales situation. You know, a lot of people come around to your door and they want to sell you this. Some of them can be quite aggressive and they'll sign people up. And one of the reasons the government has the out clause where, you know, for the next few days you can change your mind having signed up for something is because people are susceptible to being pressurized. If I think you're going to pressurize me, I do not want to relate to you. I do not, maybe I'll listen to you because I'm being polite, but I do not want to I commit to anything. I just want to get out of this conversation. So we build rapport in a number of ways. We build trust in the relationship in a number of ways. And, uh, and one of the most important ways is how we use our body. For example, if I'm wanting to share the gospel with somebody who's sitting at a bus stop on a seat, um, how am I going to achieve this without them feeling threatened or intimidated, with, without them feeling that they're, they're uh, in charge of this conversation, so they're a little secure here. So body language is important. The best uh, approach is to sit beside the person at their level. That tells them that I'm not considering myself superior, but I'm at their level. My body ideally ought to be facing more or less the same direction as theirs. If I'm facing them directly head on, that is a conflict body language situation. It's me here opposed to them here. Okay? If I'm sitting beside them, looking in the same direction, and visibly relaxing, I become unthreatening. And the, and the body language is saying, here is this person and me looking at an issue together as equals. Now make sure you don't sit too close. Uh, if you sit too close, people feel uncomfortable, and this is partly a cultural thing. But there is a healthy distance uh, to stay from a person so that you're not invading their personal state space they're not feeling threatened they're feeling secure okay so if you sit too close they might think that you're after something immoral uh, that you're interested in them sexually in some way sit too far away that's a difficulty as well um, but uh, but you don't want to sit too close so you want to be looking in the same direction you want to have a healthy distance between you and you want to switch into relaxed mode. Fold your arms, slouch back a little bit, look relaxed. Because you're engaging in this activity, not like a salesperson who's going to do a pre-prescribed pre sales pitch on somebody, like people are when they're in a shopping mall or when they're coming to your door. You're a person. You're an equal. And you've got something to share, but you're going to share it in a natural way in a relax, relaxed way, if possible. So, mind your body language, 
And mind your distance and mind the angle so that you're not confronting, that you're sitting more or less looking in the same in the same direction. You need to look around occasionally at them, and make sure they're still there. Of course you're going to feel a really real idiot, aren't you? So that all helps with rapport. Another thing that helps with the rapport is to listen and focus on what the person is saying. So it's particularly difficult for evangelists for some reason. My wife is frequently either sending me a signal or telling me, listen, you're not listening. If you're listening to me, it means that you're not just here to ram something down, down my throat. It means that you're actually interested in what I've got to say. And so um, uh, focus, focus on what I'm saying and um, uh, not, not just listen until I finish so I can quickly jump in with my answer to all of their problems, but actually listen to hear their heart and what they're saying. That communicates something, that builds rapport in the situation. Listen. It's not an easy uh, exercise, especially for those who believe we've got the answer and as soon as we can get it into you, and get you saved, it, that'll be great so we can get on and save the next person. Okay. So we need to have a bit of a pastoral heart here. As I said before, when you're dealing with a person and bringing the gospel to a person, often there's a whole lot of baggage standing in the way. It might be doubts, it might be questions about Christianity, it might be grudges they've got against the church or people in the church. And all of that standing in the way. And you don't find that out unless you're willing to listen. Another thing that helps build rapport, and it's not so much in a um, it's not so much in a sit down on the street chat to somebody you don't know basis. This is particularly strong with neighbours. Is allow a person to help you. Sometimes as Christians, we give the impression that we've got the answers and uh, we're the good people. We help people out. We show the love of Jesus, and then we share the gospel of Jesus. And, and we find it difficult when somebody who's a pagan or doesn't know the Lord, when they're actually offering to be kind and generous to us. Thinking, hang on a minute, I'm supposed to be the good person here. You're supposed to be the horrible, sinful pagan. I shouldn't be letting you help me, should I? And the answer is, of course you should. Because when you allow somebody to help me, that puts you in their debt. And, um, and you've trusted them enough to do that. Now, on the street, it can work out. For example, if I see a young fellow uh, who says, um, who I'm chatting to, and, and he's eating a pottle of chips, and he says to me, you want a chip? I'll normally say, thanks very much, and take one. And that's actually enhanced the relationship. We've shared food together. And uh, this is what humans do. This is not an unnatural situation. This is what people do. So allow the person to give you something, allow them to give you some food, eat their food. It's probably not demonized. And uh, that's a relational positive thing that helps build rapport. And then what we want to do ultimately is, having listened, having built rapport, is to engage them in a conversation about spiritual issues. We're there to seek to share the gospel with people. And um, initially they may not want to know about that, but what we want to seek to do is to transition the conversation naturally. And so the principle uh, nine is transition the conversation naturally, as naturally and as relaxed as, as you possibly can. And there's a number of ways to do this. Sometimes people will say, well, what, what are you doing this? What are you doing out here? And you can just transition immediately by saying, look, we're out here to chat to people and we're interested to know if people have any spiritual needs. And, um, and if they have, we're very happy to share uh, what we've discovered to be true, good news, with them. Now that's an immediate transition. 
and because um, they ask the question. If they're not asking that question, there's a way of bringing people to ask the right questions. Not an emotionally manipulative way, but, but uh, just to open up, open up the conversation to spiritual things. And one of the ways to do that is to drop bait into a conversation. I call, uh, I call bait anything which uh, shows them I'm religious and uh, that I'm not ashamed of it. I hope that I've been communicating the love of God with them. I've been showing an interest in them. I've been chatting to them about their recent visit to the doctor. Uh, I might have even, even at this stage offered to pray for them or told them that I will pray for them and make sure you do, take a note of it. And people appreciate that sort of thing. So, um, so you can drop bait into the conversation in a number of ways. For example, on Monday morning at the office, or university lecturers, you can just, when people say, what do you do on your weekend? You can say, well, I went to church. You know, I watched some sport on TV, I went out and did some shopping, I, you know, I went to a, a, a birthday party or something, and on Sunday I went to church, and um, now what's happened there is that you've communicated the fact that you're religious. If you go to church, you're religious. And by the way, please, don't say you're not religious. I know what people mean. They say, oh, I'm not religious, I'm into relationship. But that can come across as, you're trying to deceive me. Look, if you go to church on Sunday morning, you're religious, all right? In their eyes, you're religious. And, um, and so we shouldn't be afraid of the word religion. Okay, people know what it means. Don't pretend you're not religious. Yes, we are into a relationship with Jesus. Yes, we are into living the Christ-like life. And James tells us true religion is the outcome of that. Looking after the poor and the, and the, the fatherless and widows. Practical Christianity. It's religion. So because if you pretend that you're not religious, uh, people will click on that you are and they're thinking, why is this person trying trying to deceive me. So dropping bait into the conversation like saying that you go to church uh, or saying what you did at a particular time is an easy way to trigger a question because well, what it does is it, it brings a question to their mind. It, it makes them curious because they're thinking, oh, okay, well, well, what church do you go to? You know, why, why would you give up your Sunday morning to go to church? I mean, huh? And then they ask that, oh, what church are you with? And then the way that you answer that question is very important. Tr transition questions are great, but you need to answer them properly. So let's if somebody says to me, oh, you know, I've just mentioned, oh, yeah, I go to that church just along the road there. Or I go to a church in Papatoetoe, or I go to a church in New Lynn. And uh, they might say, oh, yeah, what, what religion is that? I mean, now if they're thinking, is it a Catholic church? Is it another sort of church? They may not know much about church. And, and, and so I would say, well, it's just a fairly ordinary church with ordinary people. You know, we're all, we do wrong things at times, but I find it, it's a loving place. Are you interested in, in the spiritual area of life? Okay, so what I've done is ask you a question, and you've answered it and then asked a question of them. And what's happened is you've developed a spiritual conversation not talking about the person's sin yet. Okay, you haven't zeroed on that. Remember, Jesus took quite a long time in the conversation with the lady before he said to her, go get your husband. Now that was a very good strategy because that brought out the fact that she was a, a, a woman with brokenness in her life, that she was living with a man she wasn't married to, so she was breaking the laws of Moses. And so... Um, and so we can ask, answer a question and then ask a question of them. So we'll talk about some of the good questions in a few moments. So dropping bait into the conversation is a good way of transitioning from the normal things that you chat about with a person to spiritual things. Now, another principle here is really important because sometimes people put the pressure on because they're panicking that this person may not become a Christian by the end of the conversation. Let me just say this. You have not failed if the person has not become a Christian by the end of the conversation. 
And this comes out a little bit later in that chapter, chapter that we read in John chapter 3 and John chapter 4 rather. It comes out a little bit later and I'm going to read that a little bit now. Um, just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman but no one asked what do you want or why are you talking with her? Then leaving her water jar the woman went back to the town and said to the people come see a man who told me everything I ever did. I bet they were curious about that. Curiosity is a big tool in sharing the gospel. Could this be the Christ? They came out of the town and made their way towards him. Meanwhile his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, could someone have brought him food? My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do you not say four months more and then the harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now the reaper draws his wages. Even now he harvests the crop for eternal life. So that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps, is true. Now listen to this, please. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work and you have reaped the benefits of their labour. What, what Jesus is saying here, using this horticultural kind of analogy, is that there is a process in a person's life in coming to Christ. And as an evangelist, I used to feel quite deflated where I faithfully shared the gospel, I thought. But the, but the person wasn't there. The person didn't have the decency to get saved. Um, and I used to feel quite down about that. You know, I've, I've failed. I've, I've sought trusting in the power of the Holy Spirit to faithfully share the gospel with this person. And here they haven't got sorts. You know, they haven't decided. They're not on their knees repenting. What's going on? Why have I failed? And we need to understand that our response, that's the responsibility of the Holy Spirit is to bring a conviction of sin and um, as we faithfully share but that there is a process. Some people are here. They have no knowledge of God. Or they have a really, really knowledge of God. And so the next step for them is to have a better understanding of the God who is really there. And then the next step is perhaps to understand the gospel. Okay? What the Bible teaches about how God has brought about a plan to rescue us. And the next stage would be for them to perhaps understand the implications of the gospel and to realize that if I'm going to give my life to God, it's going to change. It's going to cost me. It might cost me my life in some countries. And so I, uh, uh, some people are there. And then the next stage is, to, is that conviction that I need a savior. And as we share the gospel with this person, we can see that they need, they feel the need of a saviour, we offer them the saviour and they put their faith in the saviour. Now, that's wonderful. I mean, that's, that's coming through with a harvester. That's where you, your soul flies. Praise God that we saw that person come to Christ. Isn't that great? And then the next stage is for them to grow in Christ, to consider the implications, to grow in Christ, to learn to read the Bible, to be connected to the Christian community, to be baptised, putting on the uniform, and, uh, and, to, and to learn to live and mature in Christ. Now, when you go out and sit down beside a person in a bus station, or when you're having a cup of coffee with somebody that you maybe do know, Wherever it is, and often these opportunities are all around us if we've got our eyes to open them. My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. You see, one of the reasons that Jesus connected with this woman of Samaria and the rest of the disciples would have gone through there, got their takeaways and headed on their way was because his, what really fed him was to operate by the Father's agenda and connect to people with the gospel. So if in the morning we say, 
Lord, uh, if you've got an opportunity to share the gospel for me today, I pray that you'll help me to see it. I pray that you'll help me to share wisely in it. And we might see opportunities that if we're only interested in our day's activities, our work and then our entertainment and our food, if that's what really gets us going, then we may miss opportunities. Of course, food's important. Nothing wrong with entertainment, some entertainment and the normal processes of life as a student or as a worker. But if that's our main thing, uh, we might miss the opportunities. If you're a Christian, your main thing, like Jesus' main thing, should be to say, Father, I've got my plans for today, but your agenda for me is more important. Help me to live by your agenda. Help me to recognise the opportunities as they come along. So, if I take a person through faithful sharing of the gospel, through wise relationship with them, developing a rapport, if I take them from zero understanding of God or a woolly understanding of God to a clearer understanding of God, I have succeeded. Because some sow and others reap. So in this, in this context of the Bible, of the story, uh, the Samaritan uh, woman, she knew something about God, probably didn't have a very clear understanding because of the Samaritan type religion. Um, but, um, but the Jewish people, you know, the seed had been sown when they went to synagogue school, Sabbath school, when they, uh, when they were trained by their parents to know the law of Moses. The seed was put in there and some of them may have heard John the Baptist preaching. The seed was sown, the seed was sown, the seed was sown, the seed was watered, the seed was, uh, was fertilized and prayed for, and then the seed germinates, and then further down the track, the harvest comes in. Okay? So recognize that when you're engaged in, uh, out with people in evangelism, you won't necessarily be harvesting every day. Sometimes you'll be seed sowing. Sometimes you'll be watering, you'll be fertilizing, you'll be taking them a step in the right direction, you'll be explaining the gospel. It's been said that people statistically need to hear the gospel six times before they make a decision for Christ. I'm sure that's just a statistic and different people are different as I've been saying. But here's my point. Don't be in a big panic to get them here when they're here. Be relaxed about it. God can use somebody else further along the journey. In fact, you hear testimonies of people and you frequently realize that God has used a whole chain of people and events to, pe to speak to that person. And, uh, and we're out there looking for the person who needs to be saved. But for that person, the conversation that we have, we might only have two minutes, we tell them about God. We show them the love of God. Maybe we break down some of the stereotypes about what Christians are like by showing them the love of God, by just allowing God to kind of breathe his love through us, to love them through us. We've done something significant in their journey and then further along the track other people will come. So if you want to be an effective gospel sharer, relax and just fit in with where the Spirit is at work and what he's done so far in this person's life and be involved to take them a step in the right direction. And you'll find Christians out there, and sometimes they're Christians who have stopped going to church, or they're struggling with an area, and you can take them a step further into Christian maturity. So, uh, so have a bit of more of a, a broader concept of what's being achieved here. And, uh, and, and relax. And trust Trust the Lord, keep one ear on the person and one ear on the, the other one on the Holy Spirit, trusting him to give you the wisdom to know what to say. Now, along with this, along with this, principle number 12 is remember the game of golf. Okay, now you might be thinking, what well, on earth has the game of golf got to do with evangelism? I mean, do I chat to them and invite them to the golf course and play a round of golf with them and then share in the clubhouse. Is that what I'm on about? And the answer is no. Well, you can with some people. That might be a great way. 
old fellows who've got nothing to do, go out and have a game of golf and chat to them in the 19th hole and um, about the gospel or chat to them uh, chat to them um, um, as you go around the course playing their sinfulness will show up sooner or later on a golf course uh, in what they say when they miss, a, miss an easy putt okay so but that's not what I'm on about okay what I'm on about is this now if you, in case you're not a golfer little explanation okay when you start your uh, on a particular hole you've got 18 holes on a full golf course you put your you put your ball on a little tee thing okay one of those little spiky things put your ball on there and you're going to belt that thing as far as you can towards the hole all right so what you do is you take a club that's got a big head on it like me it's big headed okay and you you're going to take it back you're going to swing you're going to smack that thing as hard as you can because the closer to the hole you are on that first shot the better okay it was of course a par three hole you probably won't want to use a wood you'll want to use an iron but you're going to smack the thing okay so here's my point i don't use a great big wood when i'm just in front of the green okay I use a great big wood when I'm smacking it as far as I can from that tee. And depending on how far I've got, and sometimes, to be honest, it's not that far, I, uh, I choose the club for how far I am to the, to, the, to the target, to that hole with the flag in it. Okay? And when I'm actually up on the green, then I'm going to take my putter. I'm not going to use a wood, I'm not going to use another iron. I'm going to take my putter because that's the right tool for that job. Now, here's my point. We, if we understand where the person's at, choose the tool that's necessary. For example, if a person doesn't know about God and they think maybe it's all about evolution, well, then it's probably best not to land them with a steps to peace with God booklet, which is a booklet designed for counseling a person for salvation. It's possibly better to give them a DVD uh, like Unlocking the Mysteries of Life or something like that that tells them, shows them powerful evidence that God exists, that we have been designed, that you can't explain it by evolution. Okay? Or a booklet, um, uh, something that's not too long to read but conveys that message. So that would be the right club for the journey, you know, this book, the book or the DVD about creation. That's the, that, that's the wood, that's where you start. Now, of course, they might be further along the track, and, uh, but they've got some questions about an issue about Jesus. Now, how do you know he rose from the dead? So you'll give them something apologetic. You'll give them a booklet like My Little One, Which Faith is True, or you'll give them something about um, uh, with the evidence that Christ rose from the dead. Now, if they're under conviction of sin, and they've responded perhaps at a meeting, or they clearly recognise they need a saviour, then you might use steps to peace with God. And you might, uh, you, you'll go through the booklet with them, and you'll invite them to pray the prayer at the end. See, that's the right club. That's the putter. Okay? So the word is about creation. Uh, the, the iron's about issues. They face information they need to know and uh, obstacles that they need taken out of the pathway. Apologetics, giving evidence stuff, is about removing obstacles that are between them and the Lord. And then, and then the putter, when you're on that green, you want to get it in the hole. That's a steps to peace with God or a similar counselling booklet. And of course, once they're saved, uh, a, a follow-up on the basics of living the Christian life. That's the club to use for there. So use the golf illustration. Choose your material. Choose your tools for where they are at or where you think they are at in the journey. So there are some principles, and we're up to principle number uh, 12. That was number 12. Principle number 13 is this, before we take a break. We've got a second session coming, but before we take a break. Principle number 13 is this, be flexible, be flexible, okay. Uh, newbie Christian witnesses, 
often have programs and schedules and little routines and little ways of doing things and some people tell you that this is the best and the only way remember you're dealing with the person and you might need to stop right in the middle of this journey for them and deal with some big issues in their life I mean their mother might have just died here you come chiming along to preach the gospel and you're trying to drive them down in the right direction but actually you've got to stop here and you've got to talk about their mum you've got to show some love and some sympathy you've got to ask questions about their mum and what was special about her and it might lead you to talk about the eternal and maybe you've got to organize somebody else to come and chat to them because they're grieving and they're depressed and they don't know how to handle it and a lot of people are thinking oh I just want to get them saved well of course we do but, but they're a person and sometimes there's something along the journey that needs to be dealt with so we need to be flexible we don't want to be so obsessed it's, it's like you're in the rough you know you smack the ball it takes a bit of a sideways direction often in my case and you end up in the rough and you've got to get them out of the got to get out of the rough and so sometimes you've um, it's not a straight pathway and our people and we need to be flexible and we need to walk alongside them a little bit if we possibly can not easy to do in one conversation but maybe this conversation will lead on to a better one all right in that next session we're going to talk about what some of the key questions are the killer questions and other principles in being effective in outgoing evangelism okay we're back great and uh, we're uh, looking at principle 14 in your notes if you have them if you ha haven't don't worry and we are looking at what some of the great questions are that can help you uh, to find out where a person is on their journey on their spiritual journey so that you can help them to the next stage so one of the one of the uh, best questions initially is are you interested in the spiritual area of life you can put that in a number of ways are you interested in spiritual things um, but um, the question is you know have you got some area in your life um, or some area in your experience where you've had spiritual contact or you've had spiritual interest now they can say oh no not really uh, or they might say oh yeah I uh, occasionally think about you know these things uh, then you can ask the next question well have you ever thought of becoming a Christian and uh, or you can also ask well, what do you think a Christian is and uh, they can answer yeah 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 I've thought about that sometimes you know, maybe I had an auntie or something who used to tell me about the Christian message and about Jesus and and I thought about it but I haven't made that decision or they might say nah no, I haven't really, uh, we're not really into that, our family. But you can still ask the next question, and the next question is, is one of those uh, diagnostic questions. So it basically says, uh, if someone was to ask you what a Christian is, what would you tell them? Or you can put it another way. If a friend of yours came to you and said, look, I, uh, I want, you know, maybe I'm ill, or maybe I'm dying, I, I want to make sure I'm sorted with God how do I do that what would you tell them now their answer to that will be quite insightful it'll tell you how much they know how much they don't know or where they're at in their own journey that's the point of that question then other questions can follow like would you mind if I took a few minutes of your time to explain what the Bible says uh, what the Bible teaches about how a person can come to know and be accepted by God or you could make it even more attractive by saying look um let me buy you a cappuccino and uh and give me a few minutes no pressure but just to explain to you so you do know how a person actually gets connected with god a lot of people uh, uh, are reticent to turn down a free nice coffee especially if you throw a muffin in with it and um and they may give you an opportunity on a very casual basis you know uh, having coffee with someone is kind of non-threatening and it's nice direct conversation is maybe a little bit more threatening so maybe you can sweeten it up with a free coffee 
uh, and even a muffin if your, uh, your personal economy can stretch to that distance. And then there's others like, would you like me to help you uh, pray to tell God you want to trust him and receive the gift of eternal life? And this is where you uh, would lead the person in a prayer. Now we have to be careful with prayers. We don't want to give the impression that just praying a prayer as in parroting something earns some points with God or signs you up. They need to understand that, uh, God, that God is responding to the attitude of their heart, but they are expressing the attitude of their heart by speaking to him. If somebody offers you something, says, would you like a uh, $100? Well then, chances are you'd be tempted to open your mouth and say, yes please, I accept. And, uh, and basically, you know, there's a bit of uh, discussion about the, the prayer and should we pray the sinner's prayer. Uh, my attitude is, yeah, if you're a sinner and you want a saviour, tell him. Because in the end, prayer is just expressing the attitude of our heart, telling God that you want to be accepted by him and thanking him for eternal life. And by the way, the thanking him is important. Once, um, once I have offered you something and you have said yes, you can say thank you because if I have integrity, you've got it. It's a sign of your faith in me. So don't forget when you lead somebody through a prayer from a booklet or of your own making, uh, don't forget at the end to thank God for doing what you've asked. You know, the Bible teaches if we ask anything according to his will, we have it. It's as good as ours. Now it's not saying if you ask anything, you have it. It's saying if you ask anything that is in tune with what the Father wants for you to have. So uh, let's say to God, uh, oh dear God, um, um, I need a brand new Mercedes, uh, a sports car, convertible please. Thank you. <laughs> Don't expect it to drive up because it's probably not the Father's will for you to have that. And, um, and if it is, could you loan it to me to take my wife out sometime? Chances are there isn't. There's a whole lot of promises in Scripture that are contextual. There are promises in the Old Testament where a lot of people come unstuck theologically. Okay? This is where the prosperity guys get it all wrong. They take promises that are part of the Old Covenant that have to do with the nation of Israel living in the land of Israel. God's earthly people promised earthly blessings and earthly curses, by the way. And uh, they want to take that and transform it willy-nilly into the New Covenant, into the New Testament, the Church. But a lot of it does not fit. Okay, God has promised us security in the land. No, he's promised us persecution. We're strangers here. We're God's heavenly people. We're his representatives. Uh, we're ambassadors for Christ. We're, we're, we don't belong. We're part of a new citizenship. We have a new citizenship now. So let's not, not uh, claim things that are not for us because God's not under any pressure to fulfill your wants and desires that aren't necessarily his will. But the Bible says God wills it that no one should perish but all should come to repentance. So you can say to the person who's repentant, if they're willing to change their minds and put their faith in Christ, you can say with confidence, God will accept you. So thank him as part of the prayer. That's The, the thanks is the demonstration of faith. And uh, so prayers are useful if we're careful. Now one more thing about a prayer. And I, when I'm leading a person to Christ in a prayer, a sinner's prayer, I take it really slow. Okay, I'll often ask them to say it out loud so that I know when to go on. So if it's, dear God, I am a sinner, I'll wait for that to be said. Now I have seen world top evangelists with a big crowd of people who have called for a decision for Christ. And they're leading in the sinner's prayer. And they start the prayer. And they say it too fast. People can't 
work it through in their minds and, and restate it to God with sincerity. Because this guy has gone on and on and on in the prayer. So if you're leading in a sinner's prayer, either get the person to say it to God out loud after you, or in your own heart, repeat what you have just said slowly before you go on to the next bit. So that the person is actually engaging with God in this prayer. They're not desperately trying to, uh, to remember what you said because you've gone on. And, and, and say it in small chunks, not great big long ones that they have to remember now. What, was, what did he say? Ooh. Ooh. And by that time he's gone on or she's gone on. So be careful with sinners' prayers, but they, if they are sincere expressions of their heart attitude to God in claiming the eternal life that he has promised to anyone who comes to him, we can thank him with confidence. They may not have all amazing feelings right at that time. Some people have more feelings, different feelings, different experiences at this point. Many people say, oh, oh, I feel lighter. It's like a load is lifted off me. And that's wonderful. That's all you need. And um, so uh, the sinner's prayer is valid. It is, it is simply telling God that you're accepting his offer. Alrighty, so those questions are good. Would you like me to help you to pray and tell God that you want to trust him and you want to receive the gift of eternal life? If you believe they're serious, so how do you know if they're serious? Well, if, while you're talking to them, they're looking around at their mate. Uh, don't expect that they're there yet. There'll be a divine seriousness, there'll be a quiet urgency to get this sorted. A sign of when the conviction of the Holy Spirit is upon a person, they're not goofing around. They're taking this seriously and they want to get it sorted. Okay, So don't lead people willy-nilly through a prayer. Make sure they're sincere. Often we, with children particularly, we give them an out. We say, look now, you, we've read through this prayer. We've understood the gospel that Jesus died for our sins and God is inviting us to become his friends if we are willing to turn to him. Now we've understood this, okay, we've read through the prayer, you understand it. Now, we wouldn't want to tell God something that we don't mean, would we? And if you're not ready to give your life to Jesus and trust your life to him, then why don't you take this booklet away and think about it? Okay. But if you are ready, you stay here and we will help you to say that to God. And we find that some of the children will often go. Often they'll come back the next time that an invitation is given, and this time they're ready. Sometimes they go and pray the prayer to God on their own, and sometimes presumably they don't. But um, uh, but it's we don't want to we don't want to lead them to Christ if they're not ready to come to Christ, uh, and we don't want them to think I prayed the prayer when they weren't sincere because the prayer doesn't work. It doesn't work if they don't mean it, does it? So uh, that's an important point. Principle 16. We're nearly there, aren't we? We're getting there. Principle 16. Share the simple gospel and share it simply. One of the wonderful things about the gospel message is this. A child can understand it sufficiently to be saved. Don't be, get bogged down in the theology of it. So what is the simple gospel? Well, I've put it into four points. God created us and therefore he owns us and has a right to say how we should live our lives. And because he's our creator, he knows how we work best and what's best for us. Okay, So the, the gospel begins at creation. Creation, it gives God creator's rights over our lives. All right? He owns us. He's got the right to be our ruler as our creator. He's given us lots of freedom, but he's also given us a moral code to live by. So once that's established, then rebellion makes sense. So the second point of the gospel is, we are all sinners. Now, the word sinner is a bit of a foreign language to a lot of people. It means different things to different people. We're sinners, we've missed the mark, and you can, uh, you can use this, the Bible says we have all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. What does that mean? Well, the glory of God is the Christ-like life. It's the life that brings glory or honour to God in every aspect, every second of its existence. That's the glory of God. Jesus lived it. He's the only one who has. 
So we all fall short of that. We've all failed to live the way God wants us to. So we're sinners. And like an archer, we might have missed that that target by that much, that much, or a kilometre. We've still missed. And it only takes one sin to be a sinner. You have to steal once to be a thief. And you have to disobey God once to be a sinner. And so the second point is we're all sinners. And, uh, and, we com- um, and we're not to compare ourselves to other people. Now, a lot of people do this. They, uh, they say, well, I think God should accept me. I'm not such a bad person. Who are they comparing themselves to? They're comparing themselves to other people. And when we compare ourselves with other people, there are some people who are downright ratbags, evil people, and we feel pretty good when we compare ourselves with them. But God doesn't compare us with them. God compares us with what he made us to be. He compares us with Christ, the perfect demonstration of fully obedient human existence. And when we're compared to Christ, or the laws of God, the holiness of God is shown in the laws of God, then we realize we fall short. Now this is a very valuable thing. If somebody is arrogant, if somebody is not thinking that they're a sinner, not thinking that sin is serious, you can ask this question. And I'll put it in a story context. I was heading up north to do a seminar on evangelism, so it was useful to have an opportunity to have a fresh example. And I picked up this young fellow uh, hitchhiking, high school student, and uh, we started our conversation, and I dropped bait into the conversation, and and we got chatting, and, and then I asked him some spiritual questions. And I said to him, you know, if, 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 if we died... If you died today, would you be welcomed into heaven? He said, I think so. He said, I I go to a good school and I come from a good family. And uh, and he seemed confident in his own righteousness. But I knew he wasn't righteous. No one's righteous. So I brought the law of God before him. I said, well, part of the law of God, the moral law. I said, "Um, you ever told a lie? Well, yes, but hasn't everybody? Now notice this. He's comparing himself with other people. People do that. Have you ever stolen anything? Well, yeah, but hasn't everybody? Have you ever been sexually immoral? Well, yeah, but everybody has, haven't they? So I said, look, heaven is a perfect place. And, 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 you just told me that you're a lying, thieving, sexually immoral guy and you expect to be in heaven. Now, the result of that was that he was more humble and more open to listen when I explained the gospel to him. So when people are arrogant or they don't understand their sin, it's worth showing them the holiness of God, talking about the perfections of Jesus or using part of the Mosaic law, which... And by the way, when we come to the Ten Commandments, nine of them are taught in the New Testament anyway. The one that isn't is the Sabbath, uh, the rest day being the Saturday, because that's part of the Old Covenant, uh, so that's the Old Covenant sign, the Law of Moses sign. If you were under the covenant with Moses, well then you should, have, should keep the, uh, the Saturday Sabbath. If, uh, if you're not, and I'm not, I'm under the new covenant, uh, so I actually have my Sabbath on Monday. I, I try to keep one day off and seven off because that's from creation for everyone, but it doesn't have to be Saturday because I'm, I'm under the new covenant. So, anyway, we share, share the simple gospel. Now, some people will say they will be self-righteous, and it's helpful to be able to say to them, look, um, um, I uh, don't even keep my own standards, much less God's. And they realise that that's the same for them. And it hits home, hang on a minute, I fall short of God's standards. And so um, uh, the third point is, so once they've understood that God is the creator and has the right, has ownership rights, over their lives and that they should live with the way that he designed them and for his purposes, 
then sin makes sense, it's rebellion against God, it's missing the standard that he's given to us, and it's serious. So we're not just people who've gone a bit astray, like in Islam, we're sinners who are in rebellion. You need to get that message through. Okay, Jesus said there's two things. A lot of people say, oh, I believe in, I believe in the, uh, the, the golden rule. Do others before they do... No, no, sorry. Uh, do unto others as they would have you do to them. Uh, as, uh, as you would have them do to you. Did I get that right? We know the one. Okay. So I ask, what about the platinum rule? First of all, I ask actually, do you keep the golden rule? Well, no. But does anybody? Here we are, comparing ourselves to other people again. But what about the platinum rule? Well, what's that? Remember Jesus said the most important rule was to love God with all your heart, mind, soul and strength. The second most important was to love your neighbour as yourself. As a matter of fact, to perfectly love your neighbour, you need to love God first because then you have the Spirit's power to be able to do the second. And of course they haven't loved God with all their heart, mind, soul and strength. And so they are found guilty of breaking the most important law so that the greatest judgment is due to them. Thirdly, in the Gospel, so first we have creation, then we have the fact that we're all sinners. Thirdly, God has mounted a rescue plan by sending Jesus to die for our sins. He, is right, he was raised to life again so that as our living judge he can declare us not guilty if we put our trust in him. The Bible says that Christ died for our sins. In other words, he was the atoning sacrifice. He was the one who took the punishment, the substitutionary sacrifice. He died for our sins. He was buried and he rose on the third day for our justification. Justification is where a judge declares you to be guilt free. Only a live judge can declare you to be guilt free. A dead judge is no use to you at all. So Jesus had to rise again and declares us guilt free, free and gives us in fact his righteousness so that we're acceptable to God and fit for his presence no matter how weak and failing we have been in our Christian life. So, they need to understand the gospel. And that's the gospel. The, 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 the creation is the foundation. The sin is the bad spool. That's the bad news. But unless you understand the bad news, you won't want the good news. You won't need it. Then you have the good news that Christ died for our sins, rose again, and invites us to come to him, to trust in him, to have eternal life. And then there was the response, repentance. Now some people debate whether you need to repent or not, but to become a Christian. Okay? Now John the Baptist, uh, in his preparing the nation of Israel for the Messiah to come, preached a gospel of repentance. And what he said to them was basically this, turn away from your evil behaviour and get your hearts ready to receive the Messiah. Because many did, and they had the baptism of repentance, which was a sign that they had received John's message, that they were determined to live righteously from now on, so the Messiah would come. Okay, now, repentance for us is towards a person. It's not going through a sin list of a hundred sins, saying, okay, I'll never do that one again, and I'll never do that one again, and I'll never do that one again. I haven't been doing that one, but I've been doing that. I'll never do that again. That's not what it's talking about here. The word repent simply means change your mind. Change your mind and it's, it's, it's personhood in this. Of course it involves a change of behaviour, but we can't give up all of those things without the power of the Spirit, without knowing Jesus. Okay, So, how does this work? Well, Paul says in Acts chapter 20, in verse 20, I think it is, or 21, he's reporting to the elders of Ephesus and he says this, I have gone from house to house telling people that they need to have repentance toward God. Notice, it's toward a person. Repentance towards God. Now, the word repent means a change of mind. In other words, I need to change my mind about God so that I trust in Him now 
recognize him as God and not the other gods whatever they are that I've been following repentance towards God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ that was Paul's gospel that's our gospel okay when you repent toward God and you have faith in Jesus Christ the Holy Spirit regenerates you and he begins which means gives you new life which is, comes to dwell within you it's part of it and he and he begins the process and we use the theological term sanctification in other words you're being set apart as different you already are set apart but he's changing your behavior he's working on the areas of your life that'll make you more christ-like okay so repentance is toward god away from god's false gods recognize there's going to be a change in your life if you come to christ jesus outlined the implications of becoming his follower and yet people decided to become his follower so someone else is going to get be in charge of your life and empowering you if you're a christian jesus needs to be your lord and your god so we call them to put their faith in jesus not their faith in themselves to manage to live a life without all of these little bits of unrighteousness so that they are self-righteous we are asking them to turn to christ and trust him and his spirit will enable them to live a righteous life as they grow in him Alrighty, so we're not old testament prophets we're not john the baptists we're christians okay we're ambassadors for christ and we're telling people how to be saved so the gospel is simple god created us he owns us he's got the right to say how we should live our lives we're all sinners and have missed the mark and the fallen shore we're in rebellion and god has mounted a, a rescue plan and the death burial resurrection of christ and we need to simply receive christ trusting jesus and receiving him are effectively the same to those who received him he gave the right to become children of god you don't receive someone if you don't trust them you don't give them the right of lordship of your life if you don't trust them so when it says those who received him he's talking about those who came and put their faith in jesus from the beginning of time to the end of time the basis of god's acceptance of you and me is always the same faith in what god has revealed abraham didn't know about jesus but when god saw that he had faith in god he declared him righteous now we know about jesus now and when our faith is in jesus christ we are given the righteousness of christ as well it's a wonderful salvation no other religion in the world got anything like we've got in Christ. Alrighty. Principle 17 says this. Offer to pray for the person. Now if I've led somebody to the Lord, uh, particularly children, a child, I will lead them through the prayer and then I'll say now, you don't have to pray this to God, but I'm going to pray. You don't have to say this to God, I'm going to pray for you. And I won't normally put their hand on their shoulder I might sometimes in certain situations perhaps with a teenager or an adult um, but with children you have to be very careful how you touch children sad but that's the truth of uh, the modern world so um, praying for the person is good and a simple prayer Lord thank you for Peter who's decided today uh, to trust you with his life to trust you to accept him and to forgive his sins and I ask you to bless him I ask you to give him your joy in his heart. I pray that you'll help him grow to be a strong man who, who loves God and who shares the good news about God with others. Please protect him from the evil one and help him. Amen. And you might pray for another issue along the way. If he talked about problems in his family, you could pray about that. That's fine. But you can also pray for people if they haven't necessarily made a decision to, for christ let's just say you you're at a bus stop we do quite a bit of our, uh, evangelism at bus stops and gets interrupted when the bus comes sometimes but uh, that's life and um life's a journey and uh but you, you'll be talking to somebody and, and you haven't they know you're a christian and you've tried to share the gospel and they haven't kind of 
responded positively. And uh, but they've they've been telling you about their arthritis, or they're telling you about their 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 daughter who's been taking some drugs. And you know, um, very few people, if you are humble about it, will refuse for you to pray. So let's just say you're talking to Mrs. Mrs. Jacobson here. And you've, you've talked to her about her faith, and she may be a Christian, maybe she just doesn't go to church now and she's struggling a bit, and you've tried to encourage her. And you say, oh, well, Mrs. Jacobson, you've told me about your daughter, and, and you've told me about your health. Do you mind if I pray for you? Now, most people will say, no, that will be all right. So you can just pop your hand on her shoulder. I, in that context, I probably wouldn't close my eyes. Uh, I just say something that very simply, thank you Lord for Mrs. Jacobson. Help her to understand how much you love her. Please give her special help in times of pain and help her to recover from this illness that she's had. Um, thank you for the way you've made our bodies to repair themselves, but we pray that you'll specially strengthen her body and heal her. We want to pray for her daughter who's been who's been taking drugs, we ask you to bring the right people into her life to wake her up, to realise that things are destructive, some things are destructive, and give her the strength to stop doing that. We ask this because you said we could come and ask these things. Amen. You know, something simple like that. And you know what? A lot of times you'll turn around and Mrs. Jacobson might have been not responsive to your gospel message, not accepting of it. But a lot of times there'll be a tear in her eye. And God's touched her heart. We're emotional beings as well, you know. And praying for people is a very powerful thing, if you're wise. And um, they sense something when you're talking to God for them. Or they can do. So... Be open to praying for people. Pray for healing. Don't promise it. Don't promise it. I know that sounds like lack of faith. But the reality is, there are times when God says yes. There are times when God doesn't say yes. Don't promise something God hasn't promised. I know there are verses in the Old Testament, like, uh, praise the Lord, O my soul, who heals all your diseases. Remember he's saying, oh my soul. God heals all soul diseases, but not all spiritual diseases. And, uh, and not all physical diseases every time. Sometimes he does, and that's awesome, and we praise God for that, and give him the glory. But he doesn't. But we can pray for grace. If he's not willing to heal, he is willing to give the grace to cope. And we can ask for that. Alrighty, so so be open to praying for a person if it's if it's appropriate. Principle eighteen: Do not try to pick unripe fruit, but gently challenge people to invite and invite them to respond to Jesus. What do I mean? Well, I've got uh, I've got fruit trees, and you might think, well, it's the beginning of the season. Hoping for a oh, there's one. And you tug and tug and tug, tug, it's not ready to come off. And if it does come off, you wait for it to ripen and it doesn't, and it rots. Uh, but ripe fruit, it's easy to pick. When it's ready, it's easy to pick. It's not hard to lead people to Christ when the Holy Spirit has ripened them. And at that place along the track where he's at work in their hearts is conviction of sin. It's not hard. It's not hard to lead somebody to Christ when they're under genuine conviction of sin. So let's not try emotional manipulation and, and spiritual bullying and all that stuff. Let's be faithful with the gospel. Let's look for the opportunity. Let's genuinely and sincerely invite them to respond to God. But if they don't, we can try to talk them into it. That's fine. Paul tried to talk people into responding to Christ because of his passion in concern, and that's fine. But to manipulate them when they're not ready is, a, is, is not a good thing to do because the, the fruit's not ripe. We need to know that they're genuine and they're genuinely ready. 
um, if they are, they'll, they'll respond, I believe, and and uh, they'll grow because it's a genuine regenerative work of the Holy Spirit. And then seek to establish a follow-up connection, whether they've got saved or not. You can invite them to a Bible study group. You can invite them to an investigation group. You can ask them for their email or for their address to pop something in, in the mail to them. If you think they're still feeling a bit uncomfortable with you, just ask for their first name and their address. Say, don't need your surname because I'm not going to be coming around hassling you. But just give me your first name and your address and I'll pop something in the mail. A lot of people are quite relieved when they know that you're not going to come around knocking on their door. They don't want to be pushed into something that they're not ready for. Okay. And finally, number 20. Principle 20. I like round figures, as you can see. Principle 20. What about you, the faith sharer? Here are five things under principle 20 so that you go properly prepared. First of all, pray before you go. That God, pray before you go that God will bring about or help you to recognize divine appointments, divine opportunities, people in whose life he is at work at a point where you can make a positive contribution. Secondly, make sure you've got the materials that you need. Okay, A Bible is good, a small Bible, don't take one this size, this might make you look spiritual, but it makes you look a bit weird. Okay, and It can be an initial turn off. Not that we're ashamed of the Bible, it's just that um, we don't want any unnecessary barriers. So a smaller Bible or a New Testament, uh, have that with you when you go. And um, then a pen and a notebook. Okay, you might want to take down their details. So you need a pen and a notebook of some sort. And uh, then you want gospel booklets. They're very useful. You don't have to have booklets to lead a person to Christ. Sometimes I use that knee for God and that new for, knee for me and Jesus as the cross. Don't do it in a skirt, but I don't normally wear one of them. Um, so, um, and, uh, and Jesus bridges, you know, the bridge illustration using your kneecaps can be useful. But booklets are really good if you've got them. And, um, and we suggest uh, Steps to Peace with God written by Billy Graham, which is a good, simple booklet for leading people to Christ. The Test is a good booklet that you can use in evangelism. And uh, you, they, put, they get put to the test and they find they're not righteous after all and they need a saviour. If it's a child, we recommend uh, Becoming God's Child, uh, which is available through OAC Ministries. Or similar, there are other counselling booklets for children that are okay. You can take survey sheets, which are 10 questions. Sit down with a person, sweeten it with a snack bar, pun intended, and um, offer them a snack bar for doing a survey. It's a 10 question survey, the one available from OAC. And it's a simple way of sharing the gospel, helping them to know what they believe themselves. And a great jumping off point for a spiritual discussion. So there are different things that you can have in your, in your uh, toolkit or in your golf bag, depending on the analogy that you like to use. So let's be prayed up, let's be prepared, let's go in faith, let's be loving, let's be gentle, let's treat people as individuals, not like sheep, like a flock of sheep, and let's um, allow the Holy Spirit to lead us and to guide us. Let's have a, an attitude that we want to bring people a step, two, maybe even three, in the right direction. And if they're at an understanding of the gospel, and their heart's ready, we want to lead them to Christ. We want to harvest. And then we want to multiply the harvest. We want to, as Jesus said, and teach them to obey all things that I've taught you, basically. So we want to make a disciple that'll make another disciple that'll make another disciple. And so that uh, evangelism reaches its exponential potential. Instead of growing like this, it can grow like that. So may God bless you. Trust them for courage, trust them for wisdom, and, uh, and go lovingly. And, uh, and if, you, if you like it bombed, don't worry. 
God has saved people with some lousy sermons. But as long as the message of the gospel comes through and the love of Christ comes through, you've achieved something, you've moved them in the right direction. God bless you and go for it.